All right. So I, well, I hope you can see my screen now and, and, and uh, I'd just like to say to Ethan so thank you for inviting me to your uh, to your meeting and it's, it's it's nice to be actually at a collaborative meeting obviously there's been few few opportunities over the last year and a half and, uh, and obviously we're only down the road but in spite of that I'm still speaking to you remotely so congrat congratulations on, on on mounting this hybrid event I'm really pleased to be here uh, can everybody hear me Great. OK, so I hope you can also see my slides and really I'm going to do quite a broad brush introduction to technology and dementia from from, from partly from my research perspective, but also uh, appreciating this is a, a multidisciplinary group uh, that you, you know, some of you will obviously I, I know that many of you are experts in, in areas of, of, of dementia and technology and design. Um, 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 but also some of you may not be. So I'm going to do quite a, a sort of broad introduction to technology and dementia. So I'm based at the, in, I'm in Nottingham, just down the road, and I'm, I'm part of the University of Nottingham. And, and um, I'm, part, I'm, I'm in an organisation called Mindtech, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, which is based at the Institute of Mental Health on the Jubilee campus of, of the university. And I'm also a member of the Centre for Dementia, which is based there. I'm a principal research fellow. Again, my background is actually go back far enough. It's, it was actually in engineering and computer science, but, but for the best part of 20 years, I've really been focusing on evaluation and design methodologies and applications of those um, in really across medical devices, but also um, most recently in, in men, applied to mental health and dementia. Um, so yeah, so MindTech, just a little bit about us and, and where, we, where, where we sit in the uh, sort of research infrastructure. Um, we're one of, um, uh, well, it's a very mouthful, uh, a big, um, a quite a big term, the, the NHS MedTech and In Vitro Nut Diagnostics Cooperatives or MIX for short. And we're one of 11 MIX in England uh, focused on um, areas of unmet need in, in health services. Um, which could be addressed by technologies uh, and so yeah we've been going since 2013 that's most of the mix started then but they were originally called the healthcare technology cooperatives and then they were continued as the mix um, from 2018 and we're sort of um, coming close to the second five-year cycle um, so yeah each of the mix looks at different areas of, of, of of healthcare, and we're the, we're the specialists in 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 in, in mind uh, mental health and 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 also dementia being part of that, and uh, so, so so other clinical themes within our interests are neurodevelopmental disorders, ADHD and Tourette syndrome, um, mood or mood uh, disorders, and more broadly what would be termed sort of common mental illnesses, um, uh, depression and, and anxiety. We also also have expertise in bipolar disorder and, and psychosis, and we have particular themes um, yeah, in dementia and, and, and needs of older people. Uh, we have a theme for children and young people, and we also have a sort of cross-cutting technology theme that I'm currently the lead of. There's a small snapshot of of, of the uh, of the institute, and then that's also also the background to my video. Um, so yes, technology and dementia. Um, so, so, so broadly, how can technology help in dementia care? Um, I'm, I'm going to look at the, um, some categorizations and examples of technologies um, that, that fit with those categorizations as a sort of broad brush introduction to, to technologies. And then I'm going to look at some of the challenges for development, um, evaluation and implementation of those technologies into healthcare. So, so okay. How can technology help? Well, let's first of all, you know, have some definition of, of technologies, and so we, many of us will already have an idea what those are. And sort of common types of healthcare technologies we'll be talking about would be um, medical devices, um, and they could be di either diagnostic or interventional, so you know, involved with some kind of treatment. And increasingly, we're also seeing uh, software as, as as a medical device. And then there's the um, um, separate but increasingly integrated area of, of, of assistive technologies, and there's some experts here in, in that area. Um, and so, often thought of as um, 
broadly disability aids, uh, but also um, bringing in uh, telecare and telemedicine into that. Um, more broadly, we, we, we hear the term digital health, and that's very much about using uh, the computers, web-based or mobile and, and, and wearable um, applications that people might be carrying around with them. Um, and then we've got the ICT systems that sit behind those or are mediating the care, whether that's online or remote care, um, and also electronic records and the use of those. And there's also that general concept of in interoperability. So how do all these systems work together? Um, but also, and I think very important in, in, in dementia it, it, is to think about technologies outside of uh, uh, what would be uh, specifically healthcare uh, technologies, um, things like consumer electronics, the use of TVs and music players. Um, obviously, we, we've seen a big growth in smart home devices, cameras, virtual assistants. Um, but also, we, we should also not forget low tech technologies like uh, the use of um, whiteboards and pens and paper. And, and I'll be mentioning a, a, an example of a board game later. So things that are perhaps more tangible uh, for some people. And then the, the use of digital more broadly and online resources that are not necessarily healthcare specific that would be of, of, of interest and of, of potential use. Uh, for people uh, living with dementia. So again, really just a summary here, and, I, and, and obviously as I've, I've heard now there's experts in all of those areas, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, your talks um, this afternoon. Uh, but how does dementia interfere with daily life? So broadly uh, memory, so the, the potential to, to, to forget, uh, uh, forget things, forget appointments, uh, lose objects. Um, issues and problems with languages, whether that's expressive, so um, not being able to, um, to, re to remember words, names, uh, uh, names of places, but also in reception, so finding it harder to understand what's said. Um, praxis, so the sort of uh, voluntary action the diff and sequencing of, sequencing of actions uh, and, 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 and problems with that can and cause people problems with, uh, uh, with daily tasks, that could be dressing, washing, etc. often grouped as activities of daily living. Um, so there's, you, you may uh, have uh, problems with thinking and judgment and planning and obviously sequencing can also be part of, uh, part of, of, of planning. Um, there are, uh, there's the, um, some people can have problems with alertness and, 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 and motivation or flip side of that and, and apathy, which may, 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 may be, make it difficult to initiate um, activities. Um, there's a, a very important area, sometimes neglected, of, of, of mood and, um, and you know, sometimes called difficult behaviours within dementia, but actually, and then doesn't affect everybody um, with dementia, but, uh, but mood and depression can also be associated with, with dementia. And then not to forget physical health impairments and whether they're age related or, or specific um, as part of the dementia journey. So. So just to sort of get a sort of, uh, sort of start to break down uh, technology solutions in, in, in the dementia space, then I mean, a, I'm not, a, not going to cover all of these in, all in, in the same level of detail, but roughly we could divide those into diagnosis, uh, technologies, the, the therapies, um, technology related to physical care, as I mentioned, and then the, a bigger area, one of the, my main interests, which is in, in, in psychosocial well-being. And I'll, I'll be explaining a bit more about that. And obviously, again, I know some of you know about this already, but, but others may not. So, um, so again, I've really just got one slide on diagnosis, but I think it's useful to give you an, an example of where sort of digital tools are coming into the diagnostics process. And I think one of the uh, one tool that uh, that has been around for a little while um, is related to cognitive assessments and it's a CanTab tool from Cambridge Cognition. It's just one example of many, 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 many tools that are out there that are, that are based, the tablet based. And so this really takes a um, some kind of psychological test and, um, and, and together with uh, um, cl clinical scales, um, in, in this case for, for mental health, uh, depression and mood, but also an assessment of those activities of daily living. I mentioned before, and those things together form form an assessment, and that allows a, 
a, a support for uh, potentially a support for diagnosis of dementia. I think the interesting thing is I'm not really going to say much more about diagnosis, and I know there's the, 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 there are experts here, but uh, the, the, the um, tools like this, and in, and, and in fact early early assessment of, and also screening of dementia be has become quite a topic of debate. And, and if we look at that for, for a tool such as this, and these figures may have changed, uh, uh, but um, if we think of the ability of a tool like this to, to, to assist with the diagnosis of, of dementia, it's found that it's actually quite sensitive and, and, and figure being 100% sensitive to, to for somebody who already has a diagnosis of mild to moderate dementia, slightly less good on, on, the, on the specificity. Um, but if we look at MCI, the, 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 you know, we were getting both pulse, uh, false positives and false negatives um, um, for MCI. So again, there's, there, there are risks and a lot of conversations to be had with, with, with anybody who's, who's going to undergo a, a diagnostic test. Um, one of the one of the reasons being if um, if you um, you know if you have a low specificity then you you may be told you have dementia or MCI and in fact you don't or at least you're not going to go on to to to, to experience too many problems in the future and and that might cause anxiety at that point uh, which may be you know uh, may cause may cause more problems than 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 the uh, than the ability to know about um, the problem of uh, the cognitive problem early. Okay, so and another the the another the other second area is really is the use of technologies in in, in therapies and um, particularly thinking about digital tools, uh, but um, but also uh, there's the broad area which is a, a um, yeah, part of nice guidelines and, and and quality standards is and it probably has the most evidence of, um, behind it is cognitive stimulation therapy and uh, so some of my colleagues at Nottingham are involved in and 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 others across um, across the UK have been involved in developing that over the years. There's a really good evidence base behind it. This is conducting evidence, conducting activities with people uh, with dementia, uh, cognitively stimulating activities in, in, in a number of different areas. And um, yes, yeah, so again, there's a body of literature around it and in the, in the particular form of, of CST, it's called for short, group CST is has the most evidence and there's there's a little bit less evidence for the effectiveness or so eff efficacy of individual CST, uh, but nonetheless, some digital versions of that have been um, developed. And in fact, there was a PhD at Nottingham who developed a digital version of that called Thinkability. And if you go on, you can find it in the App Store. Um, then, um, then another area of therapy um, is it's broadly called brain training. Uh, so, it's a, um, so some kind of cognitive training um, and or stimulation or a number of apps out there for that. And, 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 and some of the, these games and gamified apps are being used in, in long term studies. In fact, I'm a subject in this trial as an older adult. I'm a subject in the PROTECT study, which was run out of well, originally KCL and now Exeter looking at the effect of playing game um, cognitive training games over long periods so so actually I, I played these games on the right for a year um, and, and, and at some early work in the protect study or precursor to the protect study did find a, a good dosing effect so, so if you play more then you get more benefit and, and even for people who started with quite so log, uh, low uh, cognitive scores improved by playing uh, these games over time so there is some evidence for the efficacy of brain training, but there's it's a very much an area of debate, and 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 there's a lot of low quality studies around, and also a lot of apps that make claims. So it's a quite an interesting area to be in. And I'm actually in a study, which has been led by a company in Denmark called Brain Plus, as part of an EU project called um, Alzheimer Disease Detect Prevent. And there's a, there's a link to that on this slide. And then two other areas of therapies. That are of interest um, certainly it, to, to my colleagues. It was a, a project tandem at Nottingham, looking at the effect of, of, of music and arts as, a, as a, um, towards therapy and dementia. And then there's actually an interesting body of evidence around just the use of computers, and and certainly as part of a longitudinal study called ELSA, um, there, there's been some interesting um, evidence that yeah, the computer use in general and um, may, may, as maybe has some preventative effects and and I think that was mentioned earlier in Eve's talk and there's a number of factors maybe you know lifestyle factors that also and these modifiable lifestyle factors that might 
you know, give you some kind of what's known as cognitive reserve. So there's a lot of interest in that area. So perhaps something more towards prevention than therapy. But, but again, there's, there's a, sometimes a bit of a crossover in the kinds of technologies that we're seeing in this space. Um, and physical care, um, I, I'm not going to say too much about this again. In fact, it's interesting that there's going to be two talks on hearing. There was a study at Nottingham called Orchard, which was looking at hearing related communications. But there are other areas of physical need um, for um, different parts of the dementia journey. And um, so mobility and continence are two things that are often affected. Uh, you've got um, you know, people with severe de dementia, maybe in, in care in care homes, um, um, have uh, have the needs uh, of, of keeping good nutrition and having good nutrition and hydration, and that might be more difficult with a cognitive um, problem or memory problem if you forget to drink, for example. And and then there's there's whole areas of yeah visual and and, and hearing um, impairments. So again, I'm going to hear about those, so I don't need to talk about those now. Um, yeah, so psychosocial well-being, that's my fourth area, and very much is the, the area that, of, that I've been most working um, in. So this is where technologies could help in encouraging um, activities, uh, um, maintaining um, activities, hobbies and interests, even after a diagnosis and maybe after the effects of, of dementia uh, um, have, start, have, have started to affect those supporting social interactions, increasing independence and generally helping to improve mood and, and or also be known as inner, inner well-being. So, so some broad things that, that I always like to think about um, when I'm talking about dementia and assistive technologies or, or technology solutions is that um, there's, a, you know, there's a good, there's a continuum between good design and technologies for older in technologies for older people and society in general and people with dementia but on the other hand are the things that are specific to dementia and that needs to be thought about carefully in terms of design obviously there's the 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 important uh, the mantra of no you know not everybody with dementia is the same and that needs do change over time we you know we, we're, we're familiar with the terms mild cognitive impairment leading to different forms of mild to moderate to severe dementia and, and you know, many people who experience the whole of that journey, and, and of course, there's also end of life considerations um, um, in dementia care. Um, there's also an increased interest in in working age dementia, or sometimes called early onset dementia. So this is a younger cohort of people who've got di maybe different histories of, of tech usage because they're younger, uh, but also they may still be working and, and maybe living with fam their, um, families. Um, so living in different household situations and so maybe have different needs than what might be um, you know, the presumptions that might be made about the kinds of people that, that have dementia. And then finally, in terms of technologies, you know, if we're thinking about introducing technologies into people's care and, and, and support, um, we have to appreciate that dementia can um, cause problems with learning so learning new things can be more difficult and therefore they might be, people might have resistance to certain technologies they're not familiar with and that familiarity is really important so the so the whole area of user acceptance and and, and, an, and very much an ethical perspective on technology and choice of technology needs to be taken it's not just about foisting uh, particular solutions on on people um, so yes, go, so going on, start, again, breaking this down a bit for, a bit more then, we've got the different, gener typically the different generations of, of, of telecare which are applied to dementia. So first generation very thought, uh, much thought about as alerts and alarms, second generation more about supporting memory and other type and also telecare, so perhaps remote care. And then the third generation is sort of, you know, we're now in the sort of ICT territory of communication devices, apps, more digital devices and robots now. Um, but we can also think about them in a different way. We can think about technologies that, um, are, that people with dementia use themselves, so, or by them, uh, um, so, or by us. Um, so things like sat navs and mobile phones and su uh, supportive devices that individuals are using, things that are used with, with uh, uh, people with dementia. And uh, maybe the things I talked about, electronic calendars, bulletin boards, maybe games, things that you do with other people, cognitive stimulation therapy, maybe could be included here. Um, and then things that are used, um, maybe um, on, you know, used on people, um, 
such as sensors, alarms, and and hoists, and and those terms are the ones that um, were, often, were used in a paper, an interesting paper by Grant Gibson and others in dementia, and very much saying actually there's there's a lot of technologies that are used on people, perhaps less less of the with and the by, and so it's just a, an appeal really to think about the with and the by. Okay, so in terms of classifications, then another nice way I think of, of thinking about technologies. Um, is about technologies that design, specifically designed for cognitive impairment, maybe a medication reminder, but also things that could be repurposed or lend, lend themselves to, 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 to people with cognitive disabilities, so maybe using a voice caller to, recorder to, to remind, to record what you're, you, what you're going to do and then play it back. But also think about technologies in another way um, where you, you've got you know, many devices and, and, and there's many things that you know, we hear the concept Internet of Things, but things that are there in the environment that you can hold, um, perhaps care robots are an example of that, but also there's a lot of technology solutions that are in the background, uh, bed sensors that you might not see uh, generally, but things like cameras and support services. Um, so again, the, there's a, the, it, it, I think it's a useful to think about the different uses of technologies, but also the different te ways that technologies can be brought in and not just health uh, what are considered to be healthcare devices okay so just some examples then so we've got some examples of um and sort of memory supporting devices just some so you I and mean, you may have come across these or you may not so things like more simplified um uh, clocks this one's really just to help with orientation we don't if you, you don't, if you can't read the time you could still benefit by knowing what time of day it is so there's a dementia clock i think developed um uh, Bath University. Um, yeah, we've got the use of these uh, objects for locator, for locating objects that you might have lost. So maybe a key fob that helps you find your keys more easily if you lose them. We've got the um, the yeah the use of of, of apps and, and um, uh, on tablets or smartphones uh, for reminiscence and leisure, and but, but also might be a part you know part of a, a, a memory stimulating process. And then some quite interesting research applications in using uh, technologies. Obviously, this is a research. This looks like a research study, and it is uh, at Waterloo in, in Canada, where they were looking at leading somebody through hand washing, um, but also looking at how they were, how well they were doing, and and if they needed any assistance, and maybe not to push somebody too hard to finish their task if they if they looked like they were getting distressed. So it's quite an interesting um, um, project that one. Okay, so. And then the second generation telecare that I mentioned very much about smart devices. Some of them are about alerts, but, but increasingly things that help you when you're out and about, G GPS locators, things that might detect falls and, and other physiological sensing. But behind that, um, systems that maybe help third parties, maybe family members or services to see how, uh, how well you're doing. So this is a, a application called Just Checking that I put, I'm ringing around now with my cursor. Um, which um, ha which looks at different rooms within the house and and whether sensors are being triggered or not and and that pattern if that changes or um, or, yeah, or maybe somebody's not visiting the kitchen maybe they're not opening their fridge or they are or indeed they're going out to outside a lot when uh, at different times of the day maybe at night that that can be detected and 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 maybe an intervention made. But the third example, yeah, obviously this has really grown. Um, so the, the the use of video, video links, but uh, but also thinking about that, you know, some of these devices are quite complex. So so can we form um, sort of more maybe simplified interfaces uh, that might be more um, easier to learn? Uh, we've got some examples of telepresence devices. This is actually this is actually deployed in the Western Highlands, uh, where where um, uh, it's a remote clinic. Uh, somebody from the remote clinic could talk to a person at home, and then we've got this example of um, of, of use of, of remote cameras, but with two ways talking. With two way talking, of course, there's ethical issues to do with all of these. Okay, just some more specific examples to finish off with. Then this idea of so there's a lot of interesting care robots. Like one of the things I often do, I give this a, a version of this talk to MSc students. And I often say, oh, yeah, have a look. What's you know, what's the what's the state of the art in care robots? And there's this Compi robot um, developed in France. It's got some uh, features, assistance features there. Um, but yeah, but also watch Robot and Frank. It's a great movie 
which um, maybe looks at some of the downsides and some of the ethical dilemmas of introducing a, um, a robot into the home and in quite a humorous way. And if you watch both of those, it's quite an interesting question to ask after watching those, whether you would actually recommend that somebody had one of these things in their home. There's a, yeah, there's, there are other examples that are arguably robotic. There's a sort of, uh, there's some, there's a robotic animals that could be maybe used in a, a for calming or as a communication um, conduit, and also um, obviously voice assistants like Alexa and other other products are increasingly used and maybe maybe find use in in in, in prompting and memory memory prompting. And some interesting um, examples of technologies in, in care homes. So, um, particularly in care facilities, um, but in some more, also in some more independent settings. So, interested in using VR to create calming environments. Um, uh, some this great one I really like this railway room um, uh, where. The, the video screen behind is actually a train journey. It could be anywhere. If, if I chose it, maybe it would be um, a trip along the peaks from Sheffield to Manchester, but that would be that would be going past while it allows you to have a conversation with a real person. So even if you can't, you're not really able to, to go and experience that journey in the real world. And an interesting example of, 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 a, of a sort of a managed environment, let's say in, in uh, which is dementia, a dementia village in the Netherlands, uh, where, the, where the, the whole environment's been designed. It's a real environment, so people are living there, but it's been designed in such a way to make it more familiar and, 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 and appealing. And then just one further for example of you know, something we quite sometimes see in the inpatient setting as well are um, our, our environments that are, that are, that are made to, to look like uh, maybe beach scenes or, or cafe, cafe environments and just something to give a familiarity and and, and, and depending on your generation, maybe to 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 make it look like the, the you know the fifties or, um, or, or or later or earlier. Okay, and I haven't mentioned yet exercise. Obviously, something very close to the heart, your heart's love for, but the the uh, the use of technology for 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 activities, exergaming gaming being the main term, and that could be done individually or in groups, but also some interest that we've had at Nottingham, we've had some research in this area um, um, around swimming and football groups, and also that how to develop the appropriate home exercises um, um, for people with dementia. Okay, and then, and then as I said, technology is not just about necessarily about the, 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 the tech, it might be something that's technology enabled, but certainly there's technologies that are, that are very much overlapping into the arts and the idea of using um, uh, digital devices to give people experiences into uh, of, of museum trips, even if they can't um, leave, leave their home. Um, obviously quite useful under COVID as well, um, but also the use of uh, perhaps of consumer devices like smart TVs, Maybe there's ways of making more personalised um, experiences, simplifying interfaces, and there's a, a whole lot of a good, a good area of, of sort of design that, that should, should, could, and should surround um, those those use of consumer devices for people with memory problems, and then the music and the arts more broadly. And obviously, I think you're probably familiar with things like dementia-friendly cinema, which is very much okay. So, so again. Some of those, a lot of those things already exist, and you know, but there's a lot of development in this area. So, and one of the one one of the I've just mentioned two of the I think one of the, one interesting area is the use of sensors, maybe in, embedded into smartphones or on wearables, to to help um, detect, maybe pre, uh, predict um, worsening or indeed uh, improvement on a day to day basis that could then lead to interventions um, or maybe. Um, that could be medical interventions or other interventions. And uh, there's also one study that you might be interested in called Radar AD, which is, I think it's led by King's College, looking at, um, at looking at sort of predictive algorithms that could be based on collecting data over long periods from individuals. And then I think another interesting area, again, I think there's experts here in you know, environmental design. And this one, I think one thing that were quite intriguing was possibly the use of lighting, sequences of lighting to help sequence um, tasks of, of, of daily living. Okay, so to 
my last section then is really about the issue, broad issues and challenge, challenges in the air as, as I see it, and the, the, there are very many. So I'll only be maybe covering, uh, won't be covering all of them, but I think there's a, especially in the sort of in the area of sort of psychosocial um, um, applications of technologies, there's this uh, uh, concept of, of, of levels of need, and I'll, I'll be talking about it on the next slide, but but technologies that shouldn't that sh couldn't should try to address those high levels of need um, it, to support choice and autonomy in in the, in, in the use of those technologies the whole that whole the whole area of co-design and making sure that we're involving it end users um, appropriately aesthetics making technology attractive there's very a lot of devices that are white boxes with red buttons still um, in terms of implementation, I need to sort of, we need to think about cost effectiveness, um, and then um, we've also got those many ethical um, issues that surround technologies, um, such as consent privacy, and, and also the, the question actually, you know, having a care robot might mean you don't see a, a person as often. So, is, is there an issue, ethical issue there? I'd just like to point you to at least one paper that was looking at some of those things around five years, four to five years ago now. Which I was a co-author on, which is to try and sort of, which is a position paper on some of the the issues of um, in assistive technologies. Okay, so just to yeah, just look at some of those areas that I mentioned. Then, so the idea of of you know trying to take a more sophisticated view on need um, that you know very much if the, if the focus is on basic care and if the te if technology is only thought about in terms of basic care. Um, then, then you know, maybe we're missing out on opportunities to, to think about the whole person, and you know, we're very fam familiar with uh, work of Kitwood and, and, and Brooker about you know, just because somebody has a condition and, and just has because somebody has a diagnosis of dementia, you know, that, that there's still a it's a whole person, and that technology should 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 take its part to to you know to re to continue to realise people's life objectives and, and not and not only to think about managing the condition so it's very much always a question to ask about any technology how well can it help a person achieve some of those higher level um, needs like self-actualization um, um, and improving self-esteem and maintaining self-esteem so yes yeah, so in choice and autonomy then there's a, this spectrum of autonomy for people living with dementia. Um, so yeah, maybe at an early stage, you, you're still making most of your own choices. You can uh, do most of the things you could do, maybe with some impairment. You can ask people to help, but, 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 but maybe at the severe end of, of, of the dementia spectrum, you, you, know, you may need more choices to be made for you or things to be provided for you. And therefore that, and the kinds of, kinds of technologies and the, the ways that technology is deployed then will be diff and potentially different. Um, and of course, the dementia journey often takes us from across that whole um, spectrum. So, and there'll be intermediates there. So essentially there's a constantly, constantly changing situation and, that, and therefore the technologies and the solutions that are, are brought in will also need to change. And that applies to the carers and, 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 and friends and, and um, as much as it does for the person with dementia. So in terms of design, then we need to think about involving all of those people in, 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 in the design process. Okay, so along with design, then we have evaluation. And so I've got, one of my interests is really thinking about the use of evaluation tools. And I'm not going to go into detail here, and, um, but um, I'm looking at the time as well, but the, there's a good number of tools of, um, out there and scales for assistive technology uh, evaluation. A couple of I've mentioned that are sort of most familiar, maybe the quick is um, a usability scale called Quest, the Quebec user evaluation of satisfaction with assistive technology scale. What may, maybe you're less familiar with is ICECAP, um, I think sort of, uh, of interest in Birmingham and also at Bangor University about um, using a scale for looking at choice and capability. Which, which could also, which is quite relevant to, to technologies. And then the one I particularly like is this PIAD scale, which is the psychosocial impact of assistive devices scale. And that's, you can see it here with three subscales. Sub 
competence, adaptability and self-esteem. I think the nice thing here is you can take any technology and say, well, does it have an effect on these areas or not? And, and, and you can get an overall score from PIADS as well, but think about maybe a, a technology allows you to feel more useful, allows, allows you to participate more, makes you actually feel like you want to try new things and improve self-esteem. Well, okay, if we could measure that, then and this scale seems to be quite a good way of at least assessing whether a technology is able to achieve that. Or it might be something like independence or sense of power or confidence, or it might be just generally a quality of life improvement, happiness, well-being, quality, yeah, quality of life. So again, quite, quite a nice tool to use. So you know, we've thought very much about how to about design. I was in a long-term program called Designing for Dementia or Mind for short, it's a bit confusing, but we're looking at mindfulness within the design process. And it ran, yeah, only just finished last year. And we developed some products and the, the, this is a series of board games which were used for, uh, well, a timeline that was used for having conversations around different parts of your life. Um, so a, a game for exploring domestic life issues that maybe have some problems that could be resolved. And, and the, the, we had a tool for trying to help solve problems. And then some a general sort of a, a advice and, and approach to mindfulness in the form of a booklet. And, and the, the, really the purpose of telling you that is, is more in how we approach the, the evaluation process. And it very much was about getting people in a room, trying out early prototypes, developing, actually developing the, the products in, in ways that we hadn't originally um, envisaged. So we, we ran these at Nottingham and other parts of the, of, 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 of the UK, but also um, across Europe. And the second product which we designed was, um, a, 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 which is still a much, very much a prototype, it was it's an app-based device for helping um, uh, people sort of set up meetings and uh, activities with people that they already know, uh, but also maybe and start with either the person or the activity and, and give them, give a way to make appointments. And again, really, this is very much about the process of, that we were using to try and explore some possibilities within that design. So we were actually looking at some sort of tabletop and tangible devices that might be more sustainable. Uh, you know, maybe having a puck on top of the person that you uh, that you um, that that was going you were going to go out with that might help to sustain memory. So there was some reason reasoning about it whether it would be a good idea to try out some of these things. And again, we, 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 we took those to end users directly. Okay, and then really finally, the, the, I think the main thing that culminated from, um, from the, this, the Mind Designing from Dementia program was we yeah, was an approach to evaluation, which, we've, which we, we coined the AIR model. And it's very much to say, if you're designing for dementia, then there are at least three things you need to consider. The activities you're trying to do, um, the, the relationships with other people and the internal world, your inner world, your, your, your mood, your, 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 uh, um, your inner well-being. And all of those things are influenced by external factors and also, and, and also obviously by the condition, but also that, that these can be influenced negatively or positively. And so a technology solution could be measured by the way it affects um, those influences, maybe improving some but also could be improving some of the expense of others. Maybe you improve a relationship and, and that helps you perform an activity better or you, or you feel better about, um, you have a better mood and therefore you have better relationships or you're more able to complete an activity. So we thought it was quite a nice, quite simple model that, that we could use with, with end users, but also uh, you know, quite useful in the design process more broadly. So that's probably one of the things that nice, be, might be interested to look at further via the website. Okay, so two more slides. Uh, really, obviously you, you come up with these solutions, but it's not always as simple as that as we know. And so uh, there's you know, a whole number of organizational issues about making technology work. So, and you've got this concept of dementia-friendly technologies. And Alzheimer's Society came up a few years ago with a technology charter, which is trying to, to, to um, suppress organizations to think about um, uh, the, how technologies can be made to be dementia friendly, but also to, to, um, to introduce technologies that can make services um, dementia friendly. And, and so that's maybe something that would be of interest if you haven't seen that before. And then, and then of course, 
okay who implements the the solution who pays for it who installs it who maintains it and there's often um it's uh, some book passing that might go on in 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 this area or, or or just some uncertainty about who's responsible and then finally i think we all know that you know we you know, we, we were familiar with with technology push so we're thinking about the market for assistive te technologies or any technologies in the dementia space there are still a lot of devices many of them haven't really been evaluated very much product led and sometimes single product led so we so they're not really they're not they're not the full part of the solution they're not necessarily interoperable um Hello? yeah somebody spoke um Hello? And then, okay, so yeah, this is my last slide. So yeah, so obviously, how do we how do we think about increasing the uptake uptake of the of the good technologies? Um, the there are some web based resources out there. I think Living Made Easy is a good one. Um, leads you through. To, you start with your problems you're having, and you can find solutions for that. And there's also Dementia Living Better with Dementia .com. But again, with all these things, it, you know, still think have to think about. Uh, how these are funded, who's responsible for them, is it local authority provided, is it personal budget, subscriptions, even you know, for maybe bigger expenses, equity releases, lots of decisions that people have to make to make technology work for them. So in summary then, yeah, there's all these technologies out there, they can be used for diagnosis, therapy, physical care, psychosocial well-being, lots of examples, um, but we, I think it's, it's really good to, to envision technologies that aim above that immediate horizon of basic care focus at all times on user experience and you know, find good ways to to evaluate it appropriately and i hope you know if you've not seen some of the tools that i've mentioned maybe maybe they'll, they'll be worth a closer look and then that hopefully we'll all achieve that that goal of realizing dementia friendly technology across society okay and thank you very much for your attention and thanks for the extra time <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. That was an amazing talk. Thank you. That was really fantastic. Really good overview. Uh, because of time, we've got space for two questions. There are two questions in the chat. One from Ahmed saying, can you give some examples of IoT technology to detect activities of daily life for people with dementia? And how can they be GDPR compliant? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Ahmed. Yeah, so I did mention that radar AD. Um, I hope I'm going to spell this right. That that's the. Let me just see if I've got that right. Um, I was going to type it into the chat. Um, is, is yeah, I was looking at um, at least detecting activity, maybe not necessarily specifically act the activities of daily living, precisely. So I'm, I'm just trying to type that. Um, yeah, that was the right address. So I'll send that to you. Um, yeah, GDP compliance and regulations are about a bit of a tricky area, I think. I think especially with things like wearables and uh, uh, mobile devices. So I see a lot of people have and are familiar with things like Fitbits and other and other devices, but they're not primarily medical devices. So. So when you, if you do produce a solution that's got a sort of medical basis, what are you regulating? Are you regulating the whole system? You're not regulating. Okay, so the the Fitbit itself might be regulated as CE or whatever it is now. The but it's regulated as a as a as a consumer device, but not necessarily as a regular as a medical device. Um, so yeah, GDPR will definitely come into it more broadly. So I think that. You know, anything that's involving personal data will have that you know personal data issue um, i'm not a regulatory expert but i, but I think it definitely is it, 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 one of the difficulties is is if you're using third-party devices that are collecting data even if you've got access to it um you know, there might be a question of gdp of uh, uh, pr compliance and particularly for sort of health related data so it's one thing to consent to to your you know activity data or heart rate being given to fitbit if it's for your you know just for your leisure purpose or when it becomes starts to become a for you know, medical purpose then it, it's a bit more tricky so 
So okay, that's that's super. Thank you. That's really helpful. And then there was a question about uh, from Tracy Richard about the intersectionality of learning disability and dementia. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and how that would relate to some of the technological devices you've you've discussed and what have you? Yeah. Well, yeah. No, thanks. That's, that's a really good question, and I think um, the um, so in terms of the intersection with um, learning disabilities, there are, I mean, there's, there's two things that spring to mind. Um, you know, there are some, um, so let's say, intellectual disabilities that, that may result in, in, a, in, a, in a higher likelihood of, of, of developing dementia, and perhaps de um, um, developing it earlier, like maybe Down syndrome being an example that I'm aware of. Um, but I think also, I think in, in terms of technologies, I think that there's also applicability of tech, you know, what are you designing for? And that's the thing, are you designing it for dementia or designing it to relieve anxiety or are you designing it to relieve? There may be some uses for technologies that are, that, you know, may, maybe people with um, learning disabilities already using that could be then transferred to somebody living with dementia. I mean, there's a good example, I think there's one I've come across called Brain in Hand, I don't know if you've, it's quite well known. And that's really aimed at people living with um, autism spectrum disorder, but, but it's very much about trying to um, to sort of mitigate uh, um, uh, um, anxiety. So the idea is actually even just having the device could help you um, feel like you've got enough support behind you that you're not going to get anxious while you're trying to achieve your goal. And, and, and there's some great examples on their website about you know people who are able to actually do that. You know, um, interact socially and 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 go and um, enter education in ways that they wouldn't have really envisaged before, and maybe those technologies could also be applied to people with dementia. So, you know, so I think I don't know. I hope that's answered the question. Obviously, no, definitely, got, definitely. Bit, I think um, it's a very complicated area, isn't it? As well for diagnostics and what have you. It is that interface is is difficult. So, great question. Thank you so much for your talk. It's been a wonderful overview of the different technologies. And I really like the way you made the different classifications. I think that really helps because it's such a minefield out there. And particularly that lack of evidence of good evidence base, I think that's something to really work on and work with people with dementia themselves uh, to co-design. And I think that's really where, where the future lies within that interface. Thank you so much.